Dr. Weber, was it time? It is, it is time. We're 46 seconds over. Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Got to get my speech out here. Announcement regarding public notice of meeting. Notice the time to replace at least committee meetings with publicized by notifying the annual news media, by updating the OPD website, and by mailing such notice to each of the district directors on April the 5th, 2013. Additionally, a copy of the open meetings law and copies of the agendas for today's meetings are available for inspection. Good morning, everybody. We'll start out this morning with the Treasurer of Finance Report, Mr. Kevin. Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have one board item, actually two resolutions, actually two board items, we have two reporting items today. The, for the two board items uh, have to do with uh, our subordinated revenue bonds. Uh, management believes that the tax exempt interest rates remain at or below current levels. It may be advantageous for the district to refund uh, two existing uh, bond issues. Our district's uh, financial advisor, Mark Lane's Capital Incorporated, has indicated that pursuing a refunding transaction in the current market is a reasonable strategy. Uh, the two resolutions we're going to vote on Thursday, first one, uh, number 59-54, would authorize the creation and issuance of one or more series of 2013 directed system of subordinated revenue bonds. The second one, resolution number 5955, authorized management to identify local and national investment banks from which to solicit, solicit bids in order to sell the bonds uh, should we proceed. Uh, again, this is a... Uh, in our bond council, uh, uh, Mr. Petter from uh, Dick Roth, who will be here on Thursday. We will go on these two items. And it will be our usual dog and pony show, so it's free. And this is where you go. Any questions uh, for the trees from the Well, are these totally, totally refinancing, correct? There's no... Uh, There's no new no money included. Okay. What type of rate do you sort of expect that you know, the ballpark figures? It looks like about three and a quarter percent. Based on the current market conditions. Will there be a home inspection or a point or anything? Okay. Next item. Information. It's uh, has to do with our with our annual review of our risk management. Uh, the district maintains risk management programs for the timely identification of risks and development of mitigation strategies. Risk can be potentially eliminated, self-insured, or transferred to a third party. The district's risk management programs include enterprise risk management, business continuity, energy risk management, and insurance. Attached uh, to paperwork here is the district 2012 risk management report, which separately summarizes the district's risk management programs. Uh, Anna Davis and John Thurber did quite a bit of work uh, on this project and gave our committee a, a full report uh,
but that is the thought. But that's okay. not really why we changed. We changed it because it was such a small percentage of our total cost that it didn't seem like it was if the program was necessary. It wasn't that much exposure to price volatility in total. Okay, our next item is our, uh, our monthly report, our financial report for the month of March. <coughs> First item is a, a revenue for the month of March of $72.2 million, which was about $4.9 million over budget. Your date revenues right now is running at $207 million, which is about $6.2 million or 3.1% over budget. Off system sales uh, for March with $10.8 million, which is about $1.9 million or 15% under budget. Uh, year to date, off system sales revenues were $28.9 million so far, which is $5.7 million under budget. Then we have less to sell and also we have two lower prices. Our OM, uh, excluding uh, fuel purchase power. Uh, for the month was uh, $39.5 million, which was about $9.5 million under budget. Year-to-date non-fuel O&M expenses are right now at $123.8 million, which is about $3.7 million or 2.9% under budget. The regular the regulatory accounting adjustment for Fort Calhoun uh, recovery cost for the month of March was $7.4 million. And, uh, including the 2012 adjustment in its, uh, its total apartment. Fuel and purchase power uh, expenses for March were $24.8 million, which is about $3.8 million over budget. Year-to-date fuel and purchase power expenses right now are running uh, uh, about $1.8 million, or about 2.6% of the budget. Net income for the month of February, excuse me, the month of March, was $2 million, which is about $3.1 million per budget. Year to date, net income was a loss of about $10.5 million so far, which is about $2.3 million per budget. So we were already making a little bit of money in March, which is better than you might expect it for this month. Year to date, uh, income. Net income was budgeted for to be uh, $52.2 million during 2013. Uh, net income projection remains unchanged at $52.2 million based on the second quarter restart of the Fort Capital Station. At this point, we do not anticipate any additional rate increase in 2013. Capital expenditures for the month were $21.6 million, which was uh, about $7 million over budget. Year-to-date capital expenditures were fit $45.8 million, which is about $6.8 million over the budget. The Edward, I, I, I think it knows on this, we do kind of explain this, the situation on that capital expenditure when it seems to be a little high, and that, that might be uh, adjusted down the road. We, we, we noticed a transaction in the month of March uh, relative to one of our service centers that looked a little unusual and large, and so we would suspect that an entry had been uh, incorrectly posted, and further research indicates that it was correct. So this, this does look like a, the right dollar now. Mainly in Omaha, so. Yeah, it's had, it had to do with the contribution aid that came from the med, uh, the med center and how it was applied. It was, it was shown as two different transactions wasn't combined. So when we put the two together, it was the right amount. Okay. It's just the way the report was put together. And the main uh, reason for the increase in capital expenditures is what? Is it for Calhoun or is it? No, it's, it's just a number of projects that are running above budget. It's not any single project. I mean, the, the Omaha Center adjustment, which is our Omaha Service Center. Right. The new one at the Med Center. The Med Center, yeah, basically, is paid for. Edward, I've got a question. If we're running projects above budget, though, it's only April, does you get a city at task list of things to do or you turn that in? How do you control that later towards the end of the year? Do you just defer some of those projects or reserve priority list put in place? We, we go through a process where we ask uh, project managers to re cash flow for the remainder of the year. And so we ask for that to be done monthly, but by September of the year, there's kind of a hard stop 
on making sure that everybody's been forecasted for a couple of reasons. Number one, we have to get a better sense of what's going to happen by the end of the year. And then we also take that into our planning process for the budget for the next year. But as we run through that, then we come back and discuss that as a senior team on where we are financially and what the cash position looks like. And, and then unexpected, you probably have some capital, unexpected things come up. So that's just factored in. You got a margin for that or set aside for that. Just no, there's deal with it. We typically do offsets. Just kind of deal with it. Yeah. We would typically do offsets on that. On that. Yeah. Or something else. We look through this and we do it on a very frequent basis, on an accountability basis with the project managers. So there would be offsets if they do the big, I'm, I'm wondering, but managing individual projects would be a typical project management. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so these take quite a bit, they can manage so these projects take quite some time. Right. You can't snap fingers and change that. And this, a lot of this is probably just timing. Between yeah, when, that's what I was getting. When they're actually getting the work accomplished and the bills paid versus when they are projected that right. happen. So, it's, so we kind of look more at the yeah. total year rather than the month. Okay, that's correct. Thank you. We're typically on our Our cash balance at uh, the end of March is, is, uh, is helping us at uh, three and a half million dollars. Excuse me, three hundred five million dollars, which is about forty nine point nine million dollars of the uh, budget. Cash balance does exclude twenty point one eight million of restricted uh, future construction funds, and fifteen point six million dollars of restricted uh, in the rest of the city to participant funds. <coughs> Anyone has any other questions concerning our financial summary? Seeing none, those are good. Thank you. We'll move on to nuclear lead and working water. Okay, I'm just going to uh, mention a couple of things and then turn it over to uh, Mr. Hansen. Uh, on uh, Tuesday, March 26th, we had a um, meeting for the Fort Camden Station. Uh, I think it's, the idea is to better put the media to report and ask questions on the work that's taking place at Fort Calvin Station. Uh, they had a tour of the uh, exterior container building where uh, work on the penetration was done in the way, and they actually got to see some of that going on at that time. They uh, uh, went into the uh, monitoring area for the radiation monitoring area. The reporter here was seeing they have video cameras inside of the containment building and the spent fuel pool. Uh, they also uh, looked at the turbine room, <coughs> including the switchgear room, and they also got to tour the simulator, the control room simulator another highlight of the, uh, of the tour. So I think this is good uh, as far as uh, trying to inform the public of what's going on. And, uh, I think uh, from what John said, Mr. Cardipazzi did a good job in uh, giving the tour and giving a nuclear 101 speech. <coughs> uh, also then we had a Category 1 NRC public meeting March 27th. Um, that was from 6 to about 10 at uh, the Devil Tree. Uh, OPPs uh, had a presentation and their theme was uh, driving to the start and discuss a plan for sustained improvement, which will California will implement after we start to continue its uh, pursuit of uh, sustained excellence. Uh, in the formal presentations, uh, Ron Short actually made a video presentation of the penetrations and what's going on with, with working penetration, which I think everyone appreciated. It was a pretty good uh, presentation. He also wanted to uh, put in a uh, discussion about flooding concerns and uh, discuss that, which I thought was good. Afterwards, there was, um, I thought, a pretty good uh, formal present, you know, uh, topics as far as uh, questions from the public is good, but from, you know, both sides coming back and forth. I also thought the NRC and the um, OPPD people had a much better uh, discussion back and forth, which it was more interesting. You know, before it was everything you're going to do, now you're doing stuff, okay, could you do it better? And uh, how can we uh, do things? And there was a mission, the regulators, we have an independent regulator uh, <coughs> and, and their group, they had suggested that they not put a certain amount of projects in to be evaluated by the NRC, but they went ahead and did it anyway, and the NRC agreed. They weren't ready for any, uh, you know, further review. So I thought it was good that it showed that we do have an independent regulator. It also said that maybe the Kelvin Station should be listening to the independent regulator. Our, our, our people, when they're not ready, don't go. Um, 
we are in a particular with the job now as far as we have an ops review now. And I think the nuclear, our, our regulators think that we're ready for it. Yeah, I think about oversight guys will believe that we're, we're ready. When well, you yeah, say independent regulator, are you talking about most I'm talking oversight. about most group and yeah, so very I, easy. I, I didn't think we had brought in somebody else. But we're, you know, we're independent, <laughs> and it's, what I think is good is that there's sort of a clash and there's a discussion yeah. going on, which should happen. It's a good process. It's, and it's, it's a good process. Uh, so I can take over to John and get yeah. the details. Thank you, Director McGuire. And uh, I would concur that uh, the oversight group led by Noel and Terry and do a field job and, and provide independent uh, verification of some of the processes and <coughs> procedures out of Fort Calhoun and, and uh, it's, it's a good uh, good oversight process. Uh, also to your point on the uh, on the media day out of Fort Calhoun, they were able to show the containment penetrations and the work that goes on there and that was good. We've talked a lot about it, but to be able to see it, understand the size and magnitude of that job and that work, and uh, it was good, I think, uh, for those involved to see that work. What kind of participation did you get from the media? I mean, what kind of response did you get? Yeah, I think I'll defer to, to you, so. We did have all the news stations. Uh, they were actively involved the entire time. Uh, we had the Blair newspaper as well, and then the World Herald had been out just a few weeks earlier and so forth, so then we did a follow-up interview with Aaron and um, reported posse after that. So there there wasn't anybody um, that was not present that day. So. Good. Good. Okay, going into the uh, oversight subcommittee report for nuclear, uh, Fort Calhoun priorities are still safety, human performance, fix the plant, use corrective action program, and training. The current plant status is the plant remained in cold shutdown with the core offload to the spent fuel pool. Status of ongoing uh, physical work, uh, we made good progress over the past month. These are some of the highlights of that work. Uh, diesel generator DG2 was removed from service earlier in the month, uh, or late, later in the month of March for relay replacements and other maintenance. Maintenance was completed along with post-maintenance testing that was successful. Uh, we did work on the 161 kV electrical service to the station involving uh, replacement of some protective relays and disconnect switches. And there again, we do post-maintenance testing. That was successfully completed and that system has returned to service. And we're currently uh, working on the 345 kV uh, system with similar maintenance and testing that will uh, be completed on April 9th, which is today. And that's gone well also. I reported this last month and work continues on raw water pump delta and uh, it was removed from service for rebuild and rewind of the motor. That's still in progress at the shop. We still uh, are working on installation of new chemical volume control system, CBCS pipe supports. Uh, we continue to work on containment penetra penetration feed-throughs. Uh, installation is 45% complete, so good progress there, good support from the uh, OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, up uh, in Buffalo, New York. Uh, containment, containment internal structure project uh, has completed the containment structures analysis and operability evaluation has been approved and is ready for inspection by the NRC. The, the NRC has begun uh, inspection of our calculations that support our operability evaluation. Uh, another project, the alternate hot leg injection project, which is a system that's used in case of an accident. It, uh, it will inject water, which will uh, treat the, uh, the possibility of uh, runoff crystal precipitation on the fuel. Uh, and that system is uh, in progress. We did put some temporary modification on to allow us to do core reload at this point. And those are our valves that are installed on the, on the primary system. And the uh, piping will be installed uh, at a later point in the outage. But that project's going along good. We also looked at the uh, high pressure safety injection pump, which had some issues with uh, proper flow or reaching the proper flow set point on the flow curve. 
uh, we have a solution for that, which will be to install a, a uh, orifice in the discharge pipe, which will get us to the proper flow set points. And then finally, uh, as far as physical work, preparations are underway for a component cooling water outage to allow for maintenance on two valves. <coughs> and uh, that work is, preparations for that is ongoing. That should begin today and conclude on the 15th of uh, April. Uh, Director McGuire did mention the media day and also the uh, public meeting that was held on the 27th. Uh, I, I saw those both as successful. Um, other items on the regulatory front, the uh, Fort Calhoun staff continues to support the uh, O350 inspection team from the NRC and support resolution of their questions. A causal analysis team to then form and investigate and identify corrective actions necessary to resolve issues identified during the inspection. And then uh, on April 30th and May 1st, uh, the SARC Safety Audit Review Committee, uh, which will be uh, evolving into NSRB, uh, which is Exelon's similar safety review board. Uh, they'll be meeting on April 30th and May 1st. Uh, NPO special focus team visit uh, to the site will be May 6th through the 10th. And then Commissioner Magwood uh, from the NRC Commission is expected to visit on May 2nd. And so, in conclusion, uh, Fort Calhoun does continue to focus on the Fort Calhoun mission of safe, event-free, cost-effective nuclear production of electricity, and the vision of safe and efficient restart of the plant and the achievement of sustained excellence. Milestones to drive core reload and plant meetup are established <coughs> corresponding uh, schedules to support that achievement. And uh, so we'll continue on that path. And that Report. How's that transition of the new SARC field going? We're still going to have our uh, uh, Dave, uh, Dave Oakley. Oakley will still yeah. report to the new committee. <coughs> yes. Uh, previous. That's correct. Yeah, we're having a meeting with him on May 2nd. John, what consumes your time in replacing the penetrations? They're so simple. Pardon me? I said it looks so simple. I well, it's not. I think uh, actually pulling out the old uh, penetration feed-throughs and putting in the new ones, I don't know the exact time percentage on that. But once they install those, then there's a wire splicing, and I'm sure uh, ensuring that the proper wires uh, are tagged, but ensuring that the right ones are spliced. Uh, <coughs> Post-maintenance post testing. Yeah. Post Thank you. That's it. That concludes our report. Very good. Move on then to public information. Director Barrett. Uh, the public information front, uh, we're going to hear uh, a report uh, to update us from Tom Richards uh, with the Nebraska Unit Panel. And also, uh, Tim Grove, I believe, is going to give a report on federal legislation on a uh, few issues and update us what's going on with the Nebraska's congressional delegation. And also, uh, Lisa Olson uh, will give a report on updating with the J.D. Powers and OPD's uh, strike wrestling. Who's first? Uh, Tom Richard. Thank you. <laughs> or if you want to wrestle. Good morning, all. Um, we're entering the 55th or 56th day of the legislature. <laughs> 34 more days to go. Give <coughs> a little overview of where we're at in the process. We're debating, uh, today, are debating uh, priority bills, uh, bills that senators have designated as their priority to get through the legislature for the year. Um, today we're dealing with uh, a Supreme Court case that had to do with the death penalty for juveniles. It went all day yesterday. It's going to go most of the day today. Big ticket items. I mean, things that uh, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, interchange and interaction going on. Um, working later in the days, um, towards the end of the month, I'll go even later days. Um, lots of discussion going on. Lots of filibustering and um, um, 
give and take at this point. So it will be over in about 34, 35 minutes. <laughs> um, I wanted to draw your attention to a couple bills that um, we're following that we've been involved in. Um, at this stage, if it hasn't moved out of committee, or it's not a committee priority or some kind of priority status, the bill probably isn't going to move forward. So I'm going to report to you on ones that have kind of moved forward at this point. Um, 340 is a bill that the Power Review Board introduced. It has, an, it has to do with waiving a hearing. The best example I can use <clears throat> is a couple months ago we did the Curry Breeze uh, wind development project. That had to go through a <coughs> hearing process with an officer, a couple lawyers, and evidence presented. This bill would allow the Power Review Board chooses to, to waive that hearing and just go to a, a you know, Submission of facts and deciding deciding how they're going to move forward. They can have the hearing if they want, but they can also waive the hearing if they don't need to do it. 363 is a bill that Senator Avery introduced dealing with the Public Records Act. His first draft of it had eight hours of uh, political subdivision employee time if you were going to uh, hold records. Uh, that eight hours of it would be uh, <coughs> free for the person <coughs> requesting the, the records got down to six and it's been amended now in its final stage is down to four hours. Um, we, we work closely with the public to make sure they get the records and Deb and I have talked about it and she's aware that that's uh, in the pipeline. A bill that we introduced as an industry called the Right of First Refusal, dealing with a Federal Energy Regulatory Commission order, giving uh, Nebraska and other, other utilities around the nation the power pool, the Southwest Power Pool has not directed, but has um, recommended that the right of first refusal be put in place on a state-by-state -state basis. Last week, the right of first refusal went through on general file. The vote was 30 to 0, and that <coughs> bill was moving ahead at this point. Um, that was one the industry as a whole really got behind and spent a lot of time on the working uh, to go through. And lastly, I would draw your attention to um, the 646 dealing with the sub-districts of uh, the Omaha Public Power District. <coughs> a week ago, last Thursday, Steve and John Lindsay and a couple of other attorneys and bill drafters met, drafted an amendment that basically reflects what you all have um, put in place as far as subdividing the districts. And you all some flexibility to do that. We work closely with the general counsels and Steve and John Lindsay, who does our contract lobbying. Um, also an attorney, work closely to get that uh, in some type of shape for Senator Morante. Senator Morante has agreed and has filed that amendment to the committee amendment and uh, gives you the flexibility to kind of move forward with what it is that you have in place. Uh, that bill is on the agenda today. It's later in the day. Um, depending on what transpires between the juvenile justice bill and 3 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, may get there, may not. Uh, but we'll, I will move down there this morning and kind of see where things are at. And with that, that's my report and comments or questions. And we would support that now. We would keep the amendment as we have. Well, that's what we agreed. What's the uh, time frame? I mean, what, you said flexibility, but that allows us uh, how long to, uh, you know, we like it in a month, is it the end of the year? What, we we signaled to the senator that we would have that done by the end of the year. The the year. So we'd have some time to really search. Right. Right. We cool. have time to do it right. Like, right. Like, yeah. Due diligence rather right. than hurrying up and rushing in. Yeah. So that's really good. My conversation with Senator Morante, you know, he has said that he's supportive of it. We still have to get it amended in the committee amendment bill. He doesn't think that would be a problem, but as you know, it's, it's a, a give and take debate, so uh, hopefully we will have a full work done to make that happen. I'm not on LB402 Bellows Bill. Mm -hmm. Could you explain a little bit what's going on there? LB402 <coughs> is a committee priority bill, uh, meaning that it most likely will have to be. There's a phrase in there that the committee amended into that had to deal with um, low um, emissions. It really doesn't have a definition of what low emission generation is. Um, we know what they're driving at. They're driving at um, natural gas, um, 
being approved for CBED projects. We've had a discussion with Senator Smith and Senator Mello. Senator Mello has filed an amendment to take that portion out. It was, it's Senator Mello's bill. Um, Senator Smith has amended that through the committee into the bill. We're working with Senator Smith and Senator Mello. Where our concern is, is that you're setting up a series of uh, natural gas projects throughout the state that could be seabed projects. And that wasn't what the intent of the community-based energy development project legislation was about. So we're working to remove that language. And just to maybe expand that a little further, I think one of the things that <coughs> you, the, the original reason why we as the industry agreed to the seabed project was the ability for us to capture wind projects that get the production tax credit benefit for the state. If we had to do it ourselves, we wouldn't be able to get the production tax credit. So that's the reason why the industry um, really agreed to and, and really got around the issue about developing the seabed um, uh, legislation that would allow us to get the production tax credit through our wind purchases. Um, but natural gas is not the same. Right. So we would oppose this. You know. So we would oppose Senator it Smith's in that regard. Natural that's gas. Other members of the industry are um, in opposition to that. So. No. That is not yet. I think what we're doing is we're, going to, we're going to there for some debate purposes, for some discussion purposes, and we'll see where it goes from there. As far as on 646, Tom, maybe I'm not eating on this, but we've got the signal from our eating.
while since I've done an update. So I thought I'd come in and uh, first do an overview of the new 113th Congress. <clears throat> we didn't have a whole lot of change after the last election cycle. The Republicans still control uh, the House. Fairly strong majorities, 232 to 200. What I thought was kind of interesting looking at the numbers, there are 84 new House members, which is quite a lot of turnover uh, from the last Congress. Um, the Senate, 100 members, uh, still controlled by the Democrats who picked up a couple seats, 53-45. Uh, the two independents typically caucus with the Democrats, so it's, in fact, 55-45. to 45. Regarding our congressional delegation, our House delegation, there were no changes. Congressman Fortenberry, Terry, and Adrian Smith were all reelected. Uh, Congressman Terry is our senior member of our entire delegation. He's been since 1998. He's on the Energy and Commerce Committee. And we're appreciative of having access to energy legislation as it comes up, and we get an opportunity to work on it directly through Congressman Terry and his staff. Regarding our Senate delegation, uh, Mike Johans is now our senior member. He's still in his first term. He's already announced that he's going to retire uh, after his term expires in 2014. Uh, Senator Nelson retired after two terms. Uh, after the last session, we have Senator Doug Fisher, who was just elected, and we've had some meetings with her and her staff to kind of get her up to speed on our public power issues. Well, with the divided House and Senate, uh, we have gridlock. It was particularly bad in the last Congress. Doesn't appear to be a whole lot better uh, this time either. There's a major divide, major philosophical divide on taxes and spending and energy and environmental policies. Some of the key issues that we're continuing to, to track and work on, uh, high-level nuclear waste, taxes and financing, uh, cybersecurity, and coal ash. High-level nuclear waste is an issue that the industry and government has been struggling with for a long time. Go back to 1982, Congress passed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, and it mandated, mandated the U.S. Department of Energy was supposed to take title and accept disposal of high-level nuclear waste by January of 1998. There is no facility. We're not even close. There was a facility, Yucca Mountain, that was designated by Congress back in 2002. It's uh, essentially been canceled back in 2010. So we're storing all of our high-level waste spent fuel on site in the spent fuel pool. And since 2006, uh, we've been storing also the dry gas storage at Fort Cowan Station. As part of the law, we pay in to this nuclear waste fund. We've got $112.5 million into it. OPPD does. That's since June of 83. Uh, nationally, there's an excess of $25 billion in the fund uh, right now. Because of Yucca Mountain being essentially canceled, the President two years ago, or actually three years ago, 2010, established a Blue Ribbon Commission on Nuclear Waste. There's a 15-member commission, including a Nebraska former Nebraska Senator uh, Chuck Hagel was on the commission in uh, January 2012. They came out with eight policy recommendations that I'll talk about in a moment. The industry uh, strongly supports implementation of these, uh, of these recommendations. This slide has all eight. I'm just going to talk about the first three. First one, new consent-based approach to citing future nuclear waste management facilities. What we had with the Yucca Mountain facility in Nevada was strong opposition within the state that felt like the site was being imposed on them. Under this process, presumably, you have a host community in state that would actually want the facility. Uh, the second one, new organization dedicated solely to implementing the waste management program and empowered with authority and resources to succeed. This would replace DOE. You'd have an entirely new federal entity that would be established, that would have one focus, that's on waste management. We think that's a very good idea. And the third one that I'll talk about, access to, to the funds, nuclear utility rate payers are providing for the purpose of nuclear waste management. Right now, the nuclear waste fund, you have to go through the congressional appropriations process, which is painful. This would take the money out, presumably in a separate lockbox that uh, would be provided then to this new organization as it move forward on establishing its whole facilities. It's going to take congressional legislation to implement all these eight recommendations. We haven't seen any introduced yet. We expect to see that later this year. And we expect to be with a lot of bipartisan support for support uh, for legislation of this type. So we're looking forward to this process getting moving and hopefully giving some solutions to how to waste. Tax debt financing. This is a, a big issue for OPPD. There's been some discussion of possibly taxing the interest on tax and bonds as part of the future tax reform legislation. This is in the context of fiscal cliff and sequestration. There's been a lot of different discussion. There's no proposal out the table on tax and financing right now, but it's something we certainly want to stay ahead of. Interest on tax and bonds has always been exempt from federal income tax. And Congress has always recognized one level of government shouldn't tax another. 
and pay, maintaining access to tax and financing for OPPD is hugely important. It's our primary uh, method of, of raising capital and what is a very capital intensive business. And any increase in the cost of capital is a direct pass through uh, to our rate payers. So we're certainly keeping an eye on it. Uh, back in January, we met with Congressman Lee Terry and his staff and asked how he might be able to help. Also, the American Public Power Association got involved with us and with Congressman Terry as well. And on uh, March 13th, he introduced a House resolution, uh, 112, that expresses congressional support for continuing finance, uh, tax and financing. It's non binding, but it would demonstrate congressional uh, long term support for tax and financing. We actually have a lot of allies on this issue. It's not just public power, cities and towns, uh, school districts would all be impacted. So, Congressman Terry is hoping to have 100 co sponsors uh, by Memorial Day, and hopefully, maybe 100 more uh, by the middle of summer, and then we hopefully get a vote in the House on this resolution. And we, of course, want to support it. Cybersecurity. Uh, this is an issue that uh, Congress has been looking at here the last couple of years. There have been a number of bills in the last Congress that were looking at it. A number were enacted into law. OPP is certainly committed to maintaining a highly secure and reliable electric generation power delivery system. It goes without saying. Uh, we strongly support the current FERC and their process. No Energy Regulatory Commission, North American Electric Reliability Corporation currently have authority on the Energy Policy Act in 2005 to establish and enforce uh, cybersecurity standards. And we're subject to annual NERC audits, and we feel like certainly the current system works very well. And we feel like if there are changes that need to be made, that the uh, FERC NERC process should be the one uh, that's used to make those changes or enhancements. And we strongly support information sharing. If there's a uh, a, a credible threat or risk that our national intelligence agency has identified. We want to know about it so we can deal with it. We also feel like there should be a single federal agency that would have the emergency oversight authority uh, to address these threats. The thing we don't want to see is multiple layers of regulation with multiple agencies that just run up costs uh, to our ratepayers without any, uh, any real benefit to enhancements of, of cybersecurity. So Congress is starting to look at this again. We're going to certainly stay involved. Uh, with our delegation of industry groups as proposals come up. Coal ash. Uh, this is another issue. EPA is looking at uh, coal ash as possibly regulating as hazardous waste. What really started this was back in, uh, I think it was December of 2008, Kingston uh, Power Plant in Tennessee, it's a TVA facility. They manage their coal ash, their ash, totally differently than we do. They put it in very large surface impoundments or ponds. They had a pond failure. They created a real mess. It was on national news, and uh, that's what got EPA's attention. OPPD handles our ash in completely dry form, our fly ash. Uh, we recycle it, and to, uh, it's, it's sold for making concrete. It's a usable material, and so we want to continue to have access to recycle it uh, as a usable material. The industry uh, strongly supports legislation that would continue to keep it available for recycling in a non-hazardous uh, in a non-hazardous capacity. Uh, APPA, LPPC has been very supportive in the last Congress, uh, doing letters and uh, expressing support for such legislation. Uh, there is significant bipartisan support in both the House and Senate for passage and enactment of such legislation. Uh, there was a bill that did pass in the House last year. Senate legislation was introduced. Uh, it didn't move forward, but we think there's going to be some opportunities perhaps this year uh, for that. We're certainly going to strongly support that. Tim, and as you yeah. mentioned there, North Omaha and Nebraska City 1 are, are totally different than what happened at Kingston. They're dry landfill, right. and, uh, and we do groundwater monitoring on those sites as well to just ensure that it's safely stored. Nebraska City, too, uses uh, a liner. Uh, we installed a line, and none of that ash is sold because the constituents that we add uh, for emissions control uh, basically don't allow us to sell it. It can't be used, I guess. So, uh, that is all landfill and uh, we have a leachate uh, collection system as well installed with that liner. So. But all the rest of the coal plants we do recycle. We do recycle. The fly ash and the, the bottom ash, there's been a market for asphalt as well. So bottom ash is what falls out in the furnace. Fly ash is what capture, is captured before it goes up the stack. So it loses its uh, toxicity when you put it in the concrete? It is new and toxic. It passes all the toxicity testing. And all the groundwater monitoring we've done has been completely clear. And, and the groundwater monitoring and everything, is that um, the NDEQ or the only ones who uh, oversee that? Or? I believe that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. 
Well, another effort that's underway, there's a bipartisan group of House and Senate Energy Committee leaders that have been meeting quietly and privately to try and develop what would be a relatively narrow and bipartisan energy bill. Um, this bipartisan group uh, met, right, there was a recess for a couple weeks, and met right before that, I think they're going to meet again next week. Uh, the hope is to develop uh, legislation later this year that would be bipartisan, would have broad support, and uh, possibly move on it uh, as early as uh, early next year. We don't know what's going to be included in the legislation. Uh, we don't know what the prospects for passage would be, but presumably if there's, it's a bipartisan bill, prospects would be good. We're hoping that perhaps coal ash, uh, high-level nuclear waste might be components of this bill. But we'll just have to wait and see. Congressman Terry's office said as soon as they know more about it, they're going to uh, work with us on that as it, uh, as it moves forward. What's the renewable environment? It seems like, you know, As far as a renewable mandate out of Congress, is very unlikely. We did get the production tax credits and the 2.2 cents per kilowatt hour extended for another year right at the end uh, last year. I guess it was in January. So there's still support for those incentives. But as far as a renewable mandate in Congress, uh, I don't see that likely anytime soon. But on all these issues, we work really closely with our delegation and certainly our industry groups. And we'll continue to do so as uh, issues come up. Do you have any questions? I have one question uh, regarding the Yucca Mountain and the, and the one stop storage situation. What, does, uh, what, what do other regions, say, you know, the countries of Europe, where do they store it? Yeah, they reprocess as well. We don't reprocess here at all. Politically, it's, it's problematic. Okay. The, the problem isn't really is not technical, it's political here or anything else. Okay. That reduces your amount of waste by how much if you recycle? I mean, for a year, I'm not sure. 90%? Sure. We recycle the, the nuclear waste? Yeah. 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 yeah, I'd be about, we would reuse about 90%. And the reason we don't do that is because it's three mile island. Oh, there's also um, yeah, proliferation yeah. issues that are that are concerned as well. Thank you. Okay. Tim, thank you very much. Thank you. Is that all in, Director Barrett? Good. Okay. Let's move on to System Management and Director Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have. Um, one board item and uh, two reporting items. Uh, the board item deals with authorizing uh, the awarding a contract for the installation of the natural gas igniter piping on Rosk City Station B2. Uh, the approval of this contract will continue to work that was completed last fall on the natural gas line from the Rosk City Station. The work remaining is for the installation of uh, the needed components individually, which will be uh, install, installed on uh, NC2 during the current outage and NC1 during their upcoming outage in 2014. Uh, our original RFP for all of this work was issued in 2012, and we rejected it due to the economic non-compliance of it. This uh, RFP included the total aspects of installation of the gas igniters at both uh, plants. Uh, we then split up the original request into smaller RFPs in an effort to decrease the overall cost of that project. And that was successful. It estimates, estimated that the overall cost savings with this approach will save approximately $750,000 compared to the original bids that were received from the original RFP. So this board action item is for one of the five uh, things that we need to do with the components. And it's for the approval for the piping installation labor for NC2 to be awarded to Grunewald Construction for the amount of $750,779. Uh, Grunewald is considered to be a quality contract, uh, contractor based on previous experience with OPP. Questions about that? Quite a, quite a spread on the bids. Quite a spread on the bids. I've never seen that big of a spread. Not so much for you, Dr. Weber, but exactly what is a gas igniter? I assume it's like, I understand the piping, but how is it used? What, what is it? Just a quick one. Well, I compared it to a, you know, your furnace. You have an igniter yeah. that ignites 
this ignites the coal and uh, when it reaches a certain temperature. So it's a gas igniter. We've been using diesel fuel. We're going to use gas now, which is going to be much cheaper. And it uses a tremendous amount of energy, obviously. Baker and all that. But so is it just these are the certain times where you get it going, or is it all the time? No, it's uh, it's typically during startup. And it's uh, I don't know the exact size of the pipe, but probably around four inches, and it'll have a like a spark plug on the end of it, which will give you your permission. But it's during startup. It'll you know heat the boiler and get you enough steam to start pouring the turbine and get you up to a certain uh, heat load, and then you'll start to introduce coal and use that fire ignition or gas fire ignition to ignite your coal, and then eventually you, you, you back out your gas and go on a whole coal pathway. Once it's gone, right? Yeah. Just a thing if, if the plant converts to natural gas at some point in the future, is this, this process lost, or does it, does it still use the same igniter? Uh, it would, but this is not sized to go on all gas. I see. It's just sized for the start of okay. the minimum load. And, we, and we, we reap a good amount of savings by going to gas versus fuel oil. That's what we're really doing. And the emissions are a lot of Yeah, this is the environmental impact. Is that is or in the great start of one after gas goes to diesel. And, and the third Huge favorable aspect is it plants seeds for potential economic development in the area. the other part that we looked at when we decided to do this. Building that gas line to yeah, connect so up. Yeah. 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 Help the rest of the city. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Second item is a um, simply a report item. And, uh, and that's to provide a status report on full supply of rail transportation and track maintenance. Our existing contracts for rail transportation and track maintenance will expire at the end of 2013. The existing contract for coal supply expires at the end of 2015. On March 7, 2013, the request for proposals for coal supply for the period 2014 to 2020 was sent out to the seven major producers in the Powder River Basin and two third-party marketers. <coughs> On March 29, 2013, bids from six producers and two marketers were received, and they are now under review by the evaluation team. Management will set April 26, 2013, at 12 noon as the final date and time for receipt, for receipt of the proposal information on coal supply contracts. No information received after such date and time will be considered in the contract award process. The, evalu the evaluation team is working on the issue of rail transportation and expects to bring it forward for a recommendation in May. Our current track maintenance contractor is Kelly Hill Company. They have provided excellent service under the current contract and upon completion of a market analysis. Uh, we expect to extend Kelly Hill services through 2020. Any comments and questions on that? Have we ever used uh, third-party marketers before in the pools? <coughs> yes, I'm sure we have. Yeah, we have. Yes, for spot, yeah. For spot, yeah. For spot, this is long-term. We've never had them as a long-term, though. Is there a no. Percentage? no. Typically, how much, what percentage of our coal do we lock up on the long, this long-term contract, and how much do we leave for spot? Uh, in the past, we've, we've tried to lock in right about 50%. <coughs> right now, we're dealing with a 30 to 50% range for term coal. Prices appear to be shifting the right way. It is the yeah. Right. Is it common to get that many bids come in? It seems to be a pretty healthy number for us. Uh, it, it, well, it is. In fact, in, in, in the past, there's been a lot of consolidation. We used to get more bids. But there's been a lot of consolidation out in, in the Congo Basin. So, but we're, we're, we're getting all of them to participate. That's the important part. Well, all aspects of this is much more in our favor, much more competitive than it has been, I assume, five years ago. Definitely. They're struggling for business. Yeah, that's what I was in, indicating, yeah. The last is uh, purchase orders in excess of 500,000 <coughs> during March. Uh, 
first one is a contract to Exitech Corporation of Maryville, Tennessee for our cybersecurity program management. That's in the amount of $1,162,400. The second is uh, for Osmos Utility Services Incorporated of Tyrone, Georgia, for ground line inspection and pole treatment. Uh, this is year six of a 10 year contract. As I understand it, we can walk away from that at any point if we're not satisfied with the. Correct. If it's not favorable and still competitive uh, for the any of the customers, we have the option to walk away and get better. Uh, and the last one is for uh, inventory of all communication com company poles and street lights. And I'm going to ask Tim Burke to talk about that. I don't know anything about that, but uh, it's from a company called Enlighten, in Omaha, Nebraska. And unfortunately, we could use a lot of that on this board. <laughs> but I don't think that's what it deals with. Um, I'm not even going to touch that <laughs> at all, but I'll talk about this item if you don't like it. <laughs> Uh, so, in this contract, we typically do uh, pole attachment uh, inventory inspections uh, about every five years. Uh, our last one that we did was in 2006. Uh, we were planning to do it in 2011, and with the flood, it just was cumbersome for us to do that. So, we delayed it a year, uh, worked on putting together the proposal uh, late in 2012 and implement uh, here in 13. But what we essentially do is hire somebody um, to actually inspect pole connections from cable companies, other telephone companies. Um, it could be a number of different connections that we have on our poles or structures. Um, and so we'll have somebody that will inventory every single one of our poles. Uh, they'll use a, an iPad uh, picture uh, to inventory it. So uh, and a database will be developed with all that information. Of this $647,000, about $428,600 will actually be reimbursed by the cable and telephone companies and other connection companies. Part of our pull attachment agreement is uh, they have to pay for this uh, audit periodically. So we typically do it about every five years, and so they'll reimburse us that $428,000, $29,000. Um, and then out of that, too, we also did a secondary bid uh, these companies that bid on the pole connection fee inventory inspections um, to do street light inventory. Uh, sometimes street lights and signals, stop lights um, are installed and sometimes we don't always get that information from the different um, authorities. And so this is an opportunity for us to essentially do that inventory as well. We got really attractive pricing for that um, and so uh, we actually incorporated it into the overall project. So. Uh, of this $647,000, about $218,000, $19,000 uh, will be uh, paid for uh, by OPPD. Uh, the rest will be reimbursed by other cable uh, connectors uh, to our poles. Tim, I've got a question the other day. I was at the pavilion and I saw a guy in a truck work a uh, street light. Mm -hmm. I said, I'll use subcontractors for some of this stuff. It wasn't really a PPD truck. Hey, it's a Saturday, they're fooling around with the street light. What is short? How many would you have? How many contractors out there? What would they do? I'll let you talk about some of the street light maintenance that we have. We have, I think, superior lighting. They provide some first response to some street light. Right. I mean, that, that's basically it. They provide that support for the street lights. And, and uh, Saturday, I guess, unless we, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of calls and a lot of problems, uh, we try to minimize that with that. Yeah, I just wondered that. We just have one contract for that. So we do any of that. Oh, we do quite a bit of that. We do. Yeah, right. We do most of it, yeah. Most of it Saturday, so. And that's typical, even for some other work, we have contractors that will do that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, a little over a million pole connections on our system. So this to give you a, a scale of what that is, a million different connections on our poles. And we actually have street lights installed, but we don't know that. Uh, there, that there, there are times, not necessarily street lights, but more like street signals, stop lights, blinking stop signs. The city uh, puts those in. Sometimes the city put those in. Other different in our system? Um, well, typically they probably already have lights there or systems there that they'll hook it. We don't necessarily hook them up. 
in, in that regard because they're typically flat rate. They're not necessarily metered in a lot of ways. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's a that, that that's a great uh, that's a great point. Um, uh, what Edward talked about is uh, they may even change out the lights. So the city of Omaha has gone from kind of incandescent lights behind the uh, street signals to LEDs. Yeah. So we need to know that too, so we can essentially charge them appropriately. Yeah. So we also add those second timers across right. the street. Not to belabor the subject, but uh, when you when a municipality installs a bunch of street lights, say one has to go through, um, does OPPD, does the municipality pay for that? Or OPPD uh, do weekly electrical? We typically do that in developments. Um, there are times where they're doing a road project and they may re put in the street lights, they may hire their own contractor to do that work. And we typically work with the city uh, jurisdictions to make sure that they do that properly. Uh, but if they're doing a highway or a, a street and they're expanding the street and they're going to redo the street lights, uh, they'll have a contractor that will be on there. Mm -hmm. But we just that's make sure that that's correct. And then we just make sure that uh, we get reimbursed uh, on the light and the maintenance of the, of the structure and the fixture. If it's in the city, the department of roads charges back to the city.
we've been trying to enlighten you despite the fact that you're low level elected. <laughs> Uh, at this time, I move that the board go into closed session at this time, 9.35 a.m. to receive an update on union negotiations and regulatory compliance matters. This closed session is necessary to receive an update on union negotiations and regulatory compliance matters. This motion requires a second to move forward. Okay. Oh, Secretary, you please call the roll. Clear. Yes. Campbell. Yes. Gay. Yes. Green. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Mines. Yes. Weather. Yes. Always. Yes. Motion approved. The motion to go into closed session is passed. This closed session will be limited to a discussion relating to an update on union negotiations and regulatory compliance matters. 